What's going on, everyone? It's your host, Neil Villapiano, and welcome to another edition of the Mofobo Network Podcast. As always, thank you guys so much for taking a few minutes out of your day to take a listen. It truly means a lot to me. Here on Mofobo, we always have a ton to talk about in the wide world of sports, and today is no exception. Today, we're going to be discussing something that I feel is very important to talk about in the world of sports reporting and journalism. Uh, something that's kind of near and dear to my heart because I originally started as a sports reporter slash uh, journalist. That is the discussion of women in the sports business and why they need to be treated as equals no matter what. Fortunately for me today, I am not alone to talk about this as we have a very, very special guest joining us here on Mofobo. She just graduated undergrad from Wichita State University with a major in sports management, so go Shockers, definitely a... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a great university, no doubt. She will be starting her master's degree at Columbia University studying sports management. And uh, fun fact for anybody, I actually took a couple of classes when I was in middle school uh, during the summer at Columbia for sports journalism. So they have a great, they have a tremendous program over there. Uh, she has her own sports reporting brand titled Sports with Aaliyah and a talk show within the brand. She's a sports reporter and she previously worked as a Campus Connect for the American Athletic conference. It is an honor to welcome on Aaliyah Funchell. Aaliyah, welcome to Mofobo Network here today. How are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Of course, and we are very excited to have you on today. Um, you know, I try to get on as many guests as possible to kind of, you know, put a little bit of uh, excitement and, and to just give people an opportunity to talk about different things and their story. And that kind of brings me to my first question for you today is, is basically, how did you become interested in sports and sports reporting in general? Yeah, well, I've actually always loved sports. So I grew up playing sports, um, specifically basketball, but um, I kind of tried a little bit of everything. Um, so I grew up playing the sport and I grew up watching the sport. My family, big sports family. So it's just kind of always been around, whether it was at home or we were going to sporting events. So I always have loved sports and then I've always loved talking to people and getting to storytell I guess mm -hmm. um, because instantly in middle school when you're finally allowed to choose electives I automatically chose broadcasting and yearbook because I wanted to be able to document different stories and aspects of people's lives and I was like never in the classroom I'd always be oh you need to interview this person okay I'll go do it and then I'd run out of the door and go get the interview um, so definitely have always loved that and it's always just been something that comes naturally to me um I can be out in a store and like my mom always like laughs at me for it because these strangers will just come up and start talking to me out of it's weird it's like a weird quality that I have and then anyone I'm with is like do you know that person I'm like no like they just came up and started talking to me and like telling me stuff um so it's always just been something that I've naturally I think been good at and something that I've loved and so, um, and then in high school as well, I was playing sports, I was a football manager, so always around sports, and then also the editor of our news magazine and in broadcast, so, um, but I really didn't click that I would be able to make a career out of it until mm -hmm. my freshman year of college, halfway through, I switched to sports management, so that's a little bit about how it started. <laughs> Well, you know, that's great. And that reminds me a lot of myself. You know, when I was a kid, I was very big into sports, um, you know, partially because I had, you know, an uncle who played the National Football League for, for a handful of years. And, you know, sports was always just big in my family. And, uh, you know, for me, it was always about, you know, trying to find something in sports that I could be good at. And once I realized that I was not going to be a professional athlete, which as a kid, it kind of breaks your heart a little bit because you're not going to get the opportunity to to live what is called the good life, I guess. Um, you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I started, I started, you know, taking classes, uh, the play-by-play -play academy, which was phenomenal for me. Um, I worked with Bruce Beck and Ian Eagle for a little bit. I, uh, I got a certification in sports broadcasting and journalism from Hofstra University back in wow. 2014. So I, I can see a lot of, you know, similarities between us about, you know, being interested in sports and being somebody that everybody just knows and goes to and asks about anything. I think I'm asked yeah. about different topics on a day-to-day -day basis. I think people ask me all the time, like, hey, what do you know about this? What do you know about that? And I don't always have the answers, but I do try <laughs> my best to have research, which I think is important in this, yes. in this business. So definitely, I really like that. Um, 
my next question, again, kind of revolves around, you know, your startup. Talk to us a little bit more about um, your brand, uh, what you like to talk about, and just, you know, everything in between. Yeah. So my brand first started my junior year of college. Um, it was when I decided to part ways. I started off college, in, I guess, like my sports reporting career with the school newspaper, and then I decided to part ways with them. And I figured, you know what, like people um, really enjoyed my work and I really became more than just a byline. And so I was like, these people know who I am right. and they are expecting my work. I felt like these people, I can't just be here for two years reporting because at Wichita State, we don't have any, or in Wichita in general, we don't have professional, major league professional sports. So right. Wichita State being D1 and then very successful in basketball, that's like the, the talk of the town. So yeah, so I was like, these people, I can't just, you know, do my first full two years of college and giving the inside scoop and having these great relationships with the athletes and the player and um, like the teams and the coaches and the personnel and then just not talk, not do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I, so I started my job with the American Athletic Conference my junior year, but that was more, that job is, it's more like an internship where you can provide a few feature stories here and there. So I didn't have that day-to-day, -day, game day, in-game, post-game content. So I'm like, you know what, I can start my own brand. And it actually started off as an Instagram page. And then I am like, no, this can be bigger. So I created a logo and um, started from there. And so it's really grown now a lot more than I would thought. And I'm very grateful for that, but it's grown from just like social media posting, like live tweets and stuff too. Now full 20 to 30 minute talk show episodes. And um, also I do um, like I've gotten into now individual athlete PR. So basically what sports Apulia covers is anything. A lot of it has been Wichita related because that's where a lot of my, viewers were before quarantine right um and then but during quarantine i've really done a lot of networking so i feel like i've grown my viewership by um you know more all across the nation so but what i like to do with the people that i do interview is i like to connect it to sports in any way i can so mm -hmm. although it's really fun to have athletes on i've had nfl players i've had um an olympic bronze medalist on in boxing wow. i've had some really big names, a lot of D1 athletes, but I also right. like to, and I think this is me being more in the sports business with my major, um, I really like to find other people like sports agents or um, people involved in the sports industry that isn't just the stereotypical, okay, you're an athlete or a coach, like we, mm -hmm. we kind of get what you do, but yep. so I kind of like to touch on everything regarding the sports industry, yep. and I definitely like to, um, I guess my interview style or what I want for sports with Aaliyah is to be very relaxed. So I like, I love having fun with the, everyone that I interview. Um, and like, I even, there's even been times where the, the Wichita state basketball players literally did, did the Fortnite dances on camera. And I'm like, where did this come from? So I love having fun, but I also love giving people a platform to share their stories. Yeah. Um, because I had like a Black Lives Matter episode or if there's a, mm. another topic they're passionate about. I never want to be someone that censors someone and I want to, you know, bring more awareness to um, things that aren't really mainstream. Like I had um, this guy named Skylar. He's actually the first transgender male division one athlete to be on a men's team. And okay. he was a swimmer at Harvard. And so I never want to, you know, be in the norm. I mean, I was, you know, it's kind of a little nerve wracking when you're not really in that a certain community to mm -hmm. shed light on something so like I always want to be a platform where people or the athletes or anyone can feel very welcome and open so that's mm -hmm. kind of what sports with Aaliyah is is kind of like not just talking about oh what's happening like what's the score like what athlete just got traded and stuff yeah. like that it's more more kind of like below the surface level and whether it's below the surface level of like let's have a lot of fun and just laugh for 30 minutes straight or let's sit down and have a very open and honest conversation yeah. so that's what I that's kind of like what sports with Leah is and what I like it to be. Well, let me be the first to say that that that's incredible. Um, I don't think that oh, there is you. enough, um, you know, sports reporting in those type of situations. Uh, I, like I mentioned before, you know, for me, one of the things that I, I realized, you know, once I kind of got into, you know, reporting everything is that we don't report enough about like women's sports and sports that just don't get a lot of attention in general. So that's what mm -hmm. I did. I, I went to a lot of these colleges in my area. I'm from New Jersey. 
We have a lot of yeah. colleges around here that don't get enough, you know, recognition. You know, you got your Rutgers, you have Princeton, um, you know, you know, things like that, Seton Hall. But, you know, there's schools like Fairleigh Dickinson, um, you know, Drew University, that people just don't know that well that I felt that they needed a voice. And that was mm-hmm. something that I did. And I, you know, talked to them. I, I gave them, you know, a, you know, gave them the opportunity to speak about their story and things like that. And, and that's great uh, to hear that. And you're, you're talking to athletes that, you know, have just tremendous things to talk about. And, and I love that. I think that that's um, phenomenal. And I love, thank you. of course, and I love the story of, you know, how you decided to create your brand. Because again, with Mofovo, it actually started right at the beginning of quarantine. I was like, well, I might as well start now because I don't have uh-huh. very much else going on. So, you know, I started this. I have a YouTube channel. Um, I have a new uh, podcast that I do for a network where I talk about the Devils, uh, the New Jersey Devils. So, you know, I, it's, been, it's been really good. Um, that's why I've considered the positives about the quarantine that I've been able to network more and kind of expand my brand uh, to a lot of people. I actually, I think the majority of people that listen to this podcast are actually from Canada. So we get so this is more, I, I would call this more of the international sports podcast that a lot of uh-huh. people from different countries tend to listen in. I don't know how I've done that, but I'd like to uh, shout out to everybody <laughs> who listens. That's what I would say. So that's yeah. phenomenal. Well, I must say I had, I had no idea that you just started this during quarantine. When I looked at your page, I honestly thought you've been doing this for years, <laughs> like this, this, like this exact yeah. show. So yeah. that's awesome. You do a really good job with it. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I had a show for three years on a network called Radio Vision Network down in South Jersey. And, um, you know, I, w- I stopped working there last October. And then, you know, for a while, once I finished, um, w- once I finished graduating from my community college, you know, this was kind of like this opportunity because I'm taking a, uh, a leap, not a leap year, I guess a, um, I forgot what they call it now. Like, a, I guess you just- A gap year? A gap year, yes. That, yes. That's you. Yeah, I'm taking a gap year to kind of let things, you know, play the way it out because obviously with what's going on with COVID-19 and all that, it's uh, it's important to uh, just let everything be, you know, as definitive as possible. So, you know, this, yeah. this is what I've been doing and, uh, you know, you're actually on for episode 30. So this has been going on for quite wow. some time. So that's awesome. A, um, somewhat of a milestone and uh, I thought <laughs> I'd, I thought I'd bring out the big guns, but I want to talk about something uh, that's like I mentioned before that that's really big. Uh, it happened last week. The biggest topic of discussion has to be the Washington Post story that talked about the 15 women who worked for the Washington Redskins that accused people within the Redskins organization or the Washington football team, uh, to be correct, of sexual harassment by former scouts and members of owner Dan Snyder's inner circle. My question to you is simply this. What was your reaction and your feelings when you heard about this story? I was definitely brokenhearted, um, but not surprised, and which is very sad to say, but I mean, there are things that happen all the time that, you know, we brush off as women in sports or we are just told to accept. So, I mean, it's not surprising, but it still broke my heart that it happened. Um, I think it's even more, you know, bad that I've seen so many people just try to like discredit them and not believe them. I'm like, you guys know, like this is, something that goes on all the time and you know this is this isn't a one-time thing this happens in a lot of organizations Mm -hmm. but this is getting a lot of attention because of this article and we're bringing attention to it and they're telling their stories so um, it was kind of disappointing to see the different reactions to it but it was also very inspiring to see also all of the support that came out of it because I've been seeing so many women obviously um, step up and say something but a lot of men in the industry too and so that is that was refreshing because there's always going to be those internet trolls that try to say, or sometimes even professionals that try to say that it doesn't exist. But the fact that there are so many other young professionals in the industry, especially males saying stuff um, in solidarity about protecting women in sports, I thought that was amazing. But um, yeah, I definitely wasn't surprised and, and we'll definitely talk more in depth, but um it's about everything about women in sports but it's sexual like harassment and for women in sports is a big deal but then there's also so many different things that women have to go through that isn't just sexual harassment that I feel like also doesn't get talked about so you have to think oh there's all of these other barriers and boundaries that 
women have to go through on top of having to deal with some of that sexual harassment. So it's just like a lot of things that start to unfold, but I'm, I'm really glad they did decide to step forward and tell their story because it, I think it's opening a whole conversation right now. This is the thing that kind of, for lack of a better term, pissed me off about the story. <laughs> that people were reacting like, that's it. Like there was nothing else. There were a lot of people that said, that's it. Like there's nothing else that comes is because for a couple of days leading up to when the story was put out in the public, there were, there were rumors around social media that there were other crazy, unbelievable things that were going to come out about the, you know, about, you know, what Dan Snyder has been doing, you know, fixing games, I think was one of them, uh, different things. And then when it came out, there were a lot of people that were, I guess for a lack of a better term, disappointed, which irritated me because it was like, no, you, you shouldn't be feeling that way. You should be mad as hell anyway, because this is not, this is unacceptable. Like, this is ridiculous that we have to, we have to, you know, lower how bad this actually is. No, this is a very serious thing. This is a very problematic thing. And I read the entire Washington Post story. And the more I read it, the more angry I got, because it was just, how could somebody be allowed to do these things and be totally getting away with it? And then the owner of the team acting like he had no idea this was going on, which was a complete lie as I think it was DJ Swearinger, the former Washington football player, actually put out uh, text messages he had from the head coach, uh, from the owner, pretty much exposing what the reality was. And I gave uh, ESPN a lot of credit that they really just kind of jumped on this story and they attacked it right from the get-go and were not afraid to go into the you know, nitty gritty of it. And I think you do have to give the women a lot of credit for speaking out and for saying, you know, what happened and, and making this public because this is important. We need to know these things so that we can try to kill. We're in a position right now in the world where we have the Black Lives Matter, you know, movement really, really being huge right now. Um, you know, women being treated fairly in general is very big and still is. And we need to try to create a much better world than we're living in right now. And I've worked with plenty of women in this industry and they are just as bright as the men, if sometimes, you know, brighter. You know, one, one woman <laughs> that I'm, I'm a big uh -huh. fan of is uh, Sarah Kustak, who uh, does the Brooklyn Nets games with Ian Eagle on the Yes Network. She knows basketball better than any man I've ever <laughs> listened to. She knows much more and she's a former <laughs> player. So she obviously knows what she's talking about. Uh, Rachel Nichols. Yeah. Another one that I really oh, enjoy. I love her. She's great. And I and she just continues to um, you know, she's phenomenal. Doris Burke, who's from, you know, New Jersey, Mama County. So represent on that one. Mm -hmm. She's great. You know, and these are and, and then you have like someone like Erin Andrews, who just she's been there for a long time and she knows what she's yeah. talking about. So, you know, it, it's you know, th those are the, you know, those women like they won't get as criticized because people are just used to them, but there are so many women that are just, you know, reporters for a team or working for a local paper that, that, that get, you know, discriminated against and get sexually harassed. There was one story that broke my heart that there was this young woman who had an internship with New York City Football Club, the soccer team based in New York City, where she said that she was basically harassed by David Villa, one of the star players of NYCFC at the time. And I believed her right from the get-go because it was it was this very long and detailed story. It was like, this, this, kid, this has to be true. And this is ridiculous that people are so, that these women are so afraid to speak about it because of the repercussions that sometimes we give them. And that's unfair. And I really hate that. And I also wanted to give you some recognition, Aaliyah, for your pinned tweet that you have here from, I think, 2018, mm. where it says, this is for all the girls wanting to break glass ceilings and go into the male-dominated career field. I hope to build my platform, not just for sports reporting, but one to inspire young women wanting to pursue a career in this industry. Here's my story. And I think I've gone through your story at least three times and I love it. I mean, I absolutely love it. Thank you. And I love that you bring this to light. And there are a lot of women that do, do an amazing job. As a Devils fan, I follow Amanda Stein, who is the Devils uh, team reporter. She is not afraid to speak about these things. People just say, oh, stick to hockey, you know, stick to what you're good. Like, no, she actually comes <laughs> out and says, she actually responded to one of your tweets. And that's actually how I came across your, your Twitter account and got to know you a little bit. 
which is which I'm very I'm very thankful that I got to. And um, you know, it's I, I give you a lot of credit because not every not everybody has the courage to really come out and speak about what's really going on and how to you know say to women, no, you can do this. You you can fight through this. Like we have to make change, and the change needs to start immediately. So I wanted to give you some credit for that. Thank you. Yeah, um, that's been my pin tweet forever because I think since day one, that's something that I wanted to build a platform around because I have faced a lot in my career already and I touch on it sometimes, but not in full detail. I do want to write a book at some point, um, maybe after grad school and like once I'm finally like working for a network, but um, I'd love to write a book about everything. But um, I've like since I at a young age, not young age, but like an incoming student in college, like facing gender discrimination, especially in the workplace is, you know, it's not okay. And there's a lot of obstacles that you have to go through. So that's why I'm very passionate because I love mentoring people. And I love, I love when someone will message me and be like, oh, I'm, uh, I'm in high school and I really want to go into the field, blah, blah, blah. But that's kind of why I do that. But I kind of like what you said earlier about um, when the allegations did come out, um, how people are like, oh, that's it. And I think our society is so used to things like keeping up with the Kardashians and right. breaking news. And then even 2020 has had some of the biggest headlines you would never imagine. <laughs> so I think, you know, people awesome. were let down because it wasn't like a movie. Oh, this right. is crazy. And which is sad because you have to think <clears throat> that these things happen, it might not seem a lot when you say it on paper. And right. I've, I've actually had that. I'm like, oh, when I, when I say it out loud, things that have happened to me, it, it just seems like a lot of little things. But those, a lot of little things add up to one big thing. And they're, you know, those are called microaggressions. And like, we talk about that a lot with the Black Lives Matter movement and, mm-hmm. and people of color, like some things you say that people don't even realize, like, those little things that they are said to on a daily basis add up. And same goes for women in sports and all of those microaggressions. And I think that, you know, that's something that is very hard to deal with as a woman in sports is when you try telling someone or try explaining why something didn't sit right with you, they're like, well, that's it. It's not like you got, it's not like they, you know, raped you. That's what someone, like, people would say that, like, oh, at least they didn't rape them. And I'm like, no, that's not it. It's just the fact that you have to go to work every single day and face um, sexual harassment. And not every woman in sports does, but like, in their case, they had to face that. But then they also had to face just, you know, the good old boys club, which is huge in sports. It's, It's the most annoying thing in the world. And so it's all of these little things that make, that add up into one big thing, which is, I think, why you know that happens and then especially women in their case um are afraid to speak out about sexual harassment is i get it i see both sides so i actually purposely took in undergrad men and masculinities and then women's studies so that i can have a better understanding of men and women and things they go through and so from what i found is you know i do see both sides i mean in the sports industry there is um there is a problem with fans or girls accusing athletes or people of power of sexual harassment just to get the fame, the money in a court case. And then it turns out they were lying right. because they had, you know, they were, they wanted all of the clout or all of what could come with being involved with an athlete. And so there has been so many pr- cases that were proven to be false accusations yeah but that is completely different from women in sports because this is our job this is our livelihood like we did not pick this career to be around athletes Mm -hmm. and to be around the men so I think that that's why a lot of us in sports and I say us I thankfully have not had anything in the sexual harassment field be big enough to be like that Um, I've had it in the gender discrimination and other things but Mm -hmm. on this topic um, I just say us as women in sports in general but it's so hard for women in sports to speak out because there are those people that won't believe us because of everything that happens with athletes in the sports world with the other people that try to accuse things and Mm -hmm. were proven false. So I think that's a big reason why some women are afraid to report. Also, they're afraid to lose their jobs, but um, 
you know, people on the internet and people in the workplace don't believe it because they're like, oh, we've seen this story so many times. And it's like, no, those are random fans. Like, mm -hmm. this is my career. This is, you know, this is my job. This is what I'm passionate about. I'm not just going to make this up just to get clout or money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I, and I would say that the two other things that I, I would want to add is simply that one is that it's not just in the sports business where women are constantly discriminated against and you know, sexually aroused. It, it happens in the regular workplace, the yes. nine to fives, you know, everywhere. It happens all the time. And part of the reason that it doesn't get any, you know, light is primarily because, you know, let's face it, sports is very big in our society and it's something yes. <laughs> that we have constant coverage of and things like that. And so, you know, it's, you know, of course we're gonna see a lot more of the stories, but for every one of those stories, there's like a hundred other stories of women being sexually harassed and, you know, having things even worse happen to them that will never get talked about and won't be able to have the confidence to shed that light on. And, and that's, and that's why I think it's important to have the, to have these things happen to have these stories come out because that it, it will give more women the confidence to then speak out about what's going on in their situation and trying to uh, make it better. So that's, that's really a big thing and i just it just it infuriates me that this just continues to happen and there's more and more people that are just not taking responsibility for what's going on because there's there's one saying that i have it says at the end of the day all you have is your personal integrity like you know who you are you know what you're about like you know you know what you believe in and what you don't believe in and i just feel like a lot of people have just gone away from their own integrity or you know you know just they were brought up that this was normal, like you were mentioning, you know, like the old, the old boys club or, you know, the old saying boys will be boys. Like that's, that doesn't work anymore. Okay. Like this is not the mm -hmm. 1920s. Okay. This is, we're not doing this again. <laughs> like, this is 2020. Yeah. Like we've already shown in this year that things need to change. And this also involves the, the whole thing about change. And unfortunately, and I'm not going to try to get into this too much because otherwise mm -hmm. it'll really like, you know, drop massive F-bombs here, but we have somebody who is the head of our country that pretty much for, you know, whether he really does it in public or not, just kind of makes it seem like it's okay to continue to discriminate against women. I mean, I look at his situation with, you know, Hillary Clinton when he was trying to run in 2016, the entire time, all he did was just insult her. Like, like not <laughs> even talk about the topics at hand, it was just insulting her. So then that just made it okay for a lot of men in general to insult women. And it, it, it really upsets me because it's, it's unacceptable. Now, I also will agree with you that there are situations where women use, you know, their, their position to try to get as much clout as possible. I remember one where um, the Chicago Blackhawks star Patrick Kane, he was, he was accused of, of raping a woman in Buffalo and they went to court and they found out that basically she had pretty much lied. And that was, you know, she just wanted to get money and, you know, attention. And that does happen. I'm not saying like that just never happens. That does happen. But there are a lot more situations where it's actually true that whatever happened mm -hmm. actually happened and nobody did a damn thing about it. And, it, and I'm, I'm really upset that we have to continue to have these conversations because I want to get to the point where we don't have to talk about this so, because it's not happening because we mm -hmm. are making actual change, because we are actually making our world better. And that, not just the United States, but all over the country, because this happened, things happen to women in other countries that, is, that can be considered 10 times worse in other countries. Like I've heard stories about certain cultures and it's, it, it, it blows my mind that we're still in the, you know, it's 2020 and we're still doing this crap. Like, yeah. I, just, I don't know, it just, it just frustrates the hell out of me. It really does. But mm -hmm. that kind of, you kind of answered my next question, which was <laughs> talking about, um, I, I guess I could still ask it actually, why do you yeah. feel the treatment of women working in sports has really not changed even after all this time? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I, I would love to find that answer. I, I just feel like there's still that stigma around women and something that, I mean, I think women's sports is incredible, but um, you know, the thought that women should just cover women's sports, I mean, from a sports reporting standpoint, but, or like women should only have coaching positions in women's sports. I feel like that just places everyone in a box and saying that, like, I feel like, you know, with the stigma, 
is there want okay yeah more inclusivity for women but I feel like because I've been told I was like someone asked me like oh is your dream job to work for ESPNW which is like the ESPN you know that covers only women's sports and I'm like no like I'd like to be on regular ESPN um because like to me the NBA has always been a big part of my life I mean I love the WNBA but like the NBA means so much to me more than it's more than just a game and more than just a league to me because you know the way they handle social issues just really speaks to me it's the thing that I bond with with my parents and my grandparents so like no I'd love to work in the NBA so I feel like the thought that women should only be able to I mean not everyone obviously people don't always have this thought but I think in sports people just think that like oh okay like you want to be in sports okay go let's clump all of the women together when in reality men should be able to cover women's sports women should cover men's sports men should have coaching positions for women's sports women should women should have coaching positions right. for men's sports right which is a big one like I've seen right. a lot of amazing women coaches in men's sports so that's yeah. another er- another thing where I'm just like you know what like I think that's huge right there is just that women shouldn't be placed in a box and I feel like people do try to put us in a box at times yeah. um but I don't know how like it's still not changed it's just crazy I mean I'm really hoping now that you know that article came out um it opens a bigger discussion and I, it has so far like even this discussion right now because mm-hmm. I hate sexual harassment I want that to end obviously but then it's also the other side of it too with the just gender discrimination in general and it's like okay what can we do to have a safe environment for women on the sexual harassment spectrum of it and then how can we have an inclusive area in sports for women? Right. And that's more so of giving us equal opportunities. And that's not always like, oh, give her the job because she's a woman. It's like, no, once you get in the job, what is your company doing to make sure we're included? Because there's been times where I've been talked down. Well, not just times. It's happened a lot. Yeah. Where like they talk down on you or they exclude you. Um, there's been situations where I couldn't go cover a certain tournament because they wanted to go on a boys trip and they w- would literally caption hashtag boys trip bros trip and I'm like wait right. what right. so it's like the little things like that is like <clears throat> yes like women need more jobs in the sports industry but like what are you doing to promote a safe and inclusive environment once they are hired so um I know that doesn't really answer the question because it's that's oh. such a hard question but I think that's what we need to do to mm-hmm. get an answer to that question is not just do the bare minimum. And I think it's important to bring attention to all of the different areas in sports where women need help and, and the industry and honestly, not just sports, like you said, but right. um, I just think, and it all stems from r- mutual respect. And I think that's the big thing is just, um, I'm not any less than anyone else because I'm a woman. Mm-hmm. And from an in, like intersectional standpoint, like that goes for black women or, trans women or LGBTQ women. so like it's just like there's so much there and I know it's a lot to learn for people and it's kind of hard to go back on um you know sometimes people are brought up just as like oh yeah this is for men and we're better but it's it's hard to teach people to be accepting which is sad to say because I'm I've always been an accepting person but mm-hmm. not everyone has been brought up to accept others so I think that it's just it takes people like you and then other people that just bringing attention to it and really trying to make a change because the more stories that are told, I feel like the more respect and change will happen. Yes. No, I, I think your answer to the question is as good as anybody can really answer it because it's true. We really don't have a definitive answer as to why this is still going on. I think you can mm-hmm. make an assumption that the way people get raised sometimes is why it continues to happen. Um, and I, me- I remember I mentioned this uh, a couple of days after the George Floyd uh, uh, murder, I actually did an episode here on Mofobo where it was just, I just pretty much went right off the cuff and I just explained about how I feel and what I think should be done. And I think it, I think it definitely is the same thing here is that when you have kids at a very young age, you need to be teaching them right away what's right and what's wrong and what actually, you know, women need to be treated the same as men. We need to accept them as equals. And this, and this is, this this should have been handled like maybe 3,000 years ago. <laughs> this is not something that, oh, in 2020, we're going to finally make change. Like, this is the thing. And this is why I got mad with Dan Snyder about the whole thing where he ch- he decided he's going to change the name of the football team. 
I said this last week, and I'll say it here for the same situation. He is not going to do anything about it unless it affects his money. It's affecting mm-hmm. his money with the whole changing of the football, football team name. So that's why he's doing it. If this gets big enough coverage, which it should, and I think it's, I, I think it's frustrating that it's, it's not getting as much coverage now as it did a couple of days ago, if it's affecting his money, he will make something, he will change something. That's what upsets me, that there are a lot of people mm-hmm. that won't do anything unless something affects them personally. That's what, I've, that's what I've been frustrated with with COVID-19, that a lot of young people, and, I, and I'm one of them, so I'm not, I'm not <laughs> myself, but I will say young people, they will go out and you know, not wear a mask and do all these things because it doesn't affect them personally. If it affects them personally, then they will start doing the right thing. That's with yeah. basically anything. So it's, this is something that we shouldn't just be doing it because it's the topic of discussion and it's because it's something that needs to be, you know, it, it, it's going on right now. This is something that's been going on for, for generations upon generations, okay? Well before, you know, people, you know, we, any of us were alive. It, it's, it's something that needs to be fixed and fixed permanently. Not something that every other year we make a small little change. No, we have to we have to create big change so that a lot of this continues to happen. And honestly, and I don't know what your feelings towards this are, but my feelings are the fact that you had this situation with the, you know, him, uh, Dan Snyder being forced to change the name of the team, and then you also have this thing on top of it. I don't know how this person could still be the owner of the Washington football team. I mean, we yeah. had a situation with Donald Sterling a couple of years ago where he was ki- where he was forced out of you know owning the Los Angeles Clippers because of constant racist remarks and things of that nature. This is this is really no different to me. This is something where, to be very honest with you, he should be forced to you know stop being the owner and being forced to sell the team. I I don't know. What I, that, but yeah, I. Earlier this week, I said Washington just needs to get wiped out, like make a new team somewhere else, new owners, new everything. Right. But I mean, that might make some people mad because I know there's a lot of Washington fans. But I mean, um, no it's just no it's live. just crazy that um, someone can have so much, so many strikes against them, not in just one area, but so many different areas. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's very alarming. So I sometimes it's scary in sports to have a change of leadership, but I think not just for the PR standpoint of it. But even I think getting rid of him would send a, a message saying to people like we as Washington fill in the blank, do not whatever they decide to change the name to, do not stand for this. But I feel like they already have with their past and their history and the fact that it took them this long to change the name. It's like I feel like people won't really value whatever they do anymore because it's like, OK, are you doing this as a PR stunt? Are you doing this because you truly believe that it's wrong? So, yep. I mean, that's why I'm just like, just wipe out the entire team and make a new team somewhere else. But um, obviously, they're not going to do that. But I mean, it's just so hard when you have so many strikes against you and a a deeply rooted history in um, racism and sexism and just, I don't know, it's it's hard. So Of course. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. Look, a lot of, and and I'm sure because you're a big NBA fan, you could could probably laugh at this that, you know, I I don't remember the last time the Knicks fans didn't want James Dolan to sell the, sell the Knicks. (laughs) Um, I will say this, and this is somewhat of a defense of James Dolan, but uh, for all you listeners, don't, don't assume that I'm just, I'm a big fan of James Dolan. I'm not, I'm really not. I think you should sell the team, everything. I have not heard any stories this crazy about James Dolan. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Like, there's mm-hmm. obviously the possibility that it could happen. It's just not brought into light. But they're not going to force him to sell the Knicks if something crazy like this doesn't happen. Like, it's just not going to happen. Because I will say this to every sports fan, and, I, and this is so true. The interest of the fans is not the same as the interest of the owners. The owners Mm -hmm. vote in the commissioner of the league. So the commissioner, in this case, Roger Goodell, he would have to try to get the support of virtually every other owner in the National Football League before he makes that decision. Because if he makes that decision and half the ownership groups don't agree, he's probably going to be out of a job within the next year or two. And that's the unfortunate thing because he doesn't really have any power in a way. Mm -hmm. He's the commissioner of the league but he doesn't have very much power over what goes on. And Dan Snyder was one of the people that voted him in as commissioner of the NFL. So 
it, it, it's just frustrating because it's almost like we have to get to the point where it's so astronomical that there's no other choice but to remove him. And mm -hmm. like you said, you nailed it right on the head. Anything that this Washington team does from here on out, we'll always assume, oh, it's because Dan Snyder is losing money. Like, if they all, you know, if, if Dan Snyder, you know, decides to make real change, he's still going to be criticized to say, oh, it's because he's losing money, he's losing support. Because we, they have a ton, the Washington football team has a ton of investors that are already looking to sell their shares because they want nothing to do with what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dan Snyder, the day after this, this article came out, he made a statement in public and he didn't even acknowledge, he didn't even say the word woman or women in the statement. He never acknowledged the fact that, that it was women that were involved in this and everything. And it was just like, see, this is the point. Like Dan Snyder in many ways seems like he's a very racist, very sexist, very whatever you want to call him type of owner. And it's like, well, let's just put this into light as well. He's not the only one. You might think yeah. that your owner of your favorite team is all clean and has no problems. I disagree. I think every single owner has their own problems. Not all the same, but certainly have their own illegal, uh, very big problem things. I'm a Giants fan. And the mm -hmm. Maras have owned the New York Giants for almost their entire existence. Do I think that they're squeaky clean? Probably not. They probably have something that's wrong that I don't agree with. Um, the, the, the Johnson family, uh, Woody Johnson in particular with the Jets, I mean, first of all, he's just a terrible owner in general for football's sake, but does he have things that are wrong? Yeah, probably. But again, I just, I just wish that Dan Snyder could really actually change his feelings, his opinions, his outlook on everything, and not be forced by other people. Like, it, mm -hmm. I get that we have to force these issues, but I wish these people could just logically and emotionally say to themselves, you know what, this is wrong and we really shouldn't be doing this. So I, so yeah, it's hard for me to want to believe anything that he says, especially if he's trying to say something positive. It's like, you know, I mean, you talk about it, the only person of reason right there, right now with that team is Ron Rivera, who mentioned that his daughter now works for the Washington football team. And he said, if that, that is not going to happen to his daughter on his watch, that is not going to mm -hmm. happen. And I, and I've told people, if that happens even a little bit, Ron Rivera's out. He is not yeah. going to stay there. He's just going to leave. So, you know, yeah. it's a tough situation. It's a real, it really is. It's a topic. And it, I, this is why I like talking about it. I like talking about things that are very controversial or very uncomfortable for listeners and, you know, people, because it's something that needs to be talked about. And my next question to you, Aaliyah, is, and, and again, thank you so much for for coming on today, we greatly appreciate yeah. it, is what should we do as a society to better ourselves when, when it comes to fair treatment of women who work in sports industry and also just in life in general and other workplaces? Yeah, well, I definitely think for anyone, I think we need to work on empathy and just like you said, like so many people do things for, and they don't care about things until it affects them personally. And I think if there is more empathy in the world and where we're able to put each ourselves into each other's shoes, that would solve a lot of our problems. Um, so I think that that's like an overall thing that needs to happen is just be, just be, be more, you know, willing to see other people's stories for, through their eyes and walk a mile in their shoes. But, um, you know, I think that it's, I've, even though earlier I said like kind of the way that people are brought up um, is why they're a certain way I think that now with the amount of access to all of this information if you're still stuck in your old ways especially if you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s like I know it's hard to teach like in your grandma that oh this is racist or this is sexist and this isn't but I mean if you're a young adult and you're still blaming things on how you were brought up like just stop like you have access mm -hmm. to so much information and so much knowledge that you yeah. should be able to form your own opinions and your own way of life um so I think that first getting rid of every all of that like be able to you know you have so much access to these stories like just be a nicer person like you don't need to blame I feel like there's a lot of blame place for the way people act yeah. but um so I think that's it and then just seeing them as 
see us women, especially in sports, just as mutuals and, um, you know, you don't need to find a woman in sports and be like, oh yeah, you work in sports. Okay. Well name the quarterback of this team during this I'm year. So and I'm like, glad you said that. I'm so glad you said that because <laughs> so many times where women have to literally defend themselves as to why they're a sports fan. Like it, it drives yeah. me, it drives me nuts. Like Whenever I meet a woman that's, that is very big into sports, I never ask them those type of questions. I just assume that they know. I just, yeah. it just it's like, all right, cool, they know. And, and that's mm -hmm. it. Like, I don't, I don't think, I don't try to like force upon them, oh, name, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's like, first of all, most guys don't even know the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. So like, let's not let, you know, if, you're, if you ask a guy the same question, he may not know the answer. So that makes, that totally kills that entire yes. that entire question yeah exactly and that's happened to me so many times and i'm like honestly like as i'm lucky that my family and i grew up watching sports but there's a lot of women in, that work in sports that it was kind of against the norm for a girl to like sports and so like they didn't grow up getting to go to nfl games and getting to watch with their dads on sundays yeah. like thankfully i did but like so a lot of like i don't know i just sports trivia like no one knows everything about sports trivia like ask me about like sports law and ethics and oh, yeah, all of this like, like you know like and so well first of all don't ask me anything because I don't need to prove myself to anyone but I mean exactly. like the fact that a lot of people ask like random trivia questions that have nothing to do with like the sports yeah. industry I'm just like what so yeah. like just little things like that that people can do that mm -hmm. they might not realize that they do so right. um, I think it's really just kind of one thinking before you speak and before you act and mm -hmm. just kind of um you know, realizing stuff you do and the preconceived um, opinions that you have on women in sports and just kind of realizing your own bias and working yeah. on yourself first. Yeah. Because not everyone has a large platform and obviously not everyone is going to use their platform like you are to bring awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's fine. But I think it just starts with um, self-reflection and start by, okay, like if I see my friends, you know, talking to this girl at a, at a game and being like oh you know like just saying stuff like being like you know that's not okay so I think it starts in your one in your own head and in your own personality mm -hmm. and then in your small circle so um not saying you have to sit around at the bar talking with your bros about like how can we respect women in sports but like if you see something just call it out point it out be yeah. like hey like that's not okay because I think a lot of people you know making a big change it does seem scary but change comes from those smaller steps so I think that's the best thing that we can do is just um you know do some self-reflection and start small no I, I really love that because again yeah I mean especially as you get older it's no longer about oh your parents need to teach you it's about you're old enough now where you can look up this stuff and you can make your own decision and that's why I've always said that sometimes it's hard to try to force someone to change once they get to a certain age, because by that point it's like, okay, look, they're an adult. If they don't decide to change, it's not going to happen. So yeah. I said before about, you know, the, the topic of racism in America, there are a lot of people that are older than I am that you could tell them to your blue in the face why it's wrong, but if <laughs> they just decide that they don't want to believe you and they don't want to do the research, don't continue to try to put your head in the lion's mouth. It's not worth it. Like, they they're old enough to make their own choices to yeah. whether they agree or disagree with whatever the situation is. So I, so again, it's the same thing here. It's like, if you choose, if you are 35 years old, if you're a 35 year old male and you're very sexist and people continue to try to tell you about why sexism is wrong and why we need to treat everyone as equals, but they don't agree with you and they continue to, you know, say no, 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 no matter how much you try forget it. It's not worth it because at the end of the day, they, they're old enough to make that choice and mm -hmm. they have to decide for themselves whether they believe it or not. Um, my last question to you, Aaliyah, is simply this. What piece or pieces of advice could you give to young women who want to get into this industry, into sports journalism, and also just in these, um, I guess, controversial workplaces where, you know, this type of situation could may or may not happen? Yeah, well, and so you brought up earlier that I did have that Twitter thread about what women in sports. I said, women right. in sports, like, drop a photo of you working in the industry because I did that because I'm like, think of all the, even high school or even in college women that 
are now too afraid to go into the industry because all of these bad stories are coming out. Mm -hmm. And although we do bring attention to the bad, working in sports is the most amazing thing. And so I think that my advice would be one, don't be too, like, don't let this defer you from your path of wanting to work in sports because there are good people out there. And now this is even more of a topic. So there will be hopefully more protection for you as a woman in sports. But um, I think the biggest thing is persistent. So I actually, just last week, I got a white tattoo around my ankle and it says, uh, it's my favorite quote. It's nevertheless, she persisted. It's written by my parents in their handwriting. But um, that's my favorite quote because persistence is a big thing. I mean, if you get knocked down, just get back up. And Mm -hmm. um, persistence is such a great quality to have, especially as a woman in sports and confidence. Mm -hmm. But I also think that and this will only, I, can, I can't I can really pinpoint for every woman or every girl wanting to work in the industry when this should happen, but there needs to be a time where you know, and you'll know it in your heart, you'll feel it, but yeah. whether it's time to keep fighting and keep persisting if you're in this, say, one organization, like, okay, I can keep fighting this and I can mm-hmm. per- be persistent or I need to walk away. And that's always a very hard um decision to make and walking away does not mean you're a quitter it just means that there's going to be another door that opens up so I think that's very important and I know I'm trying to give advice but I can't really tell someone when it's going to happen but they will be faced with an op like an opposition of do I try harder do I keep you know hitting breaking down these doors in this organization where I really can't move up or do I walk away and so I Mm -hmm. think if you go in to the industry knowing that there will be those times where you'll have to make those decisions, you'll have more of a clue because you'll be looking like, okay, is this worth it? Like, is this not worth it? So I think that's something that as women in sports, we need to do is just know when to keep pushing and when to walk away. And it's okay to walk away because when I walked away is when the most incredible things started happening for me. So, um, and that doesn't mean I was a quitter. It just means I persisted elsewhere. So yeah. Exactly. Um, that's a big thing about that is that it's okay to walk away. It's okay to stay and try to fight and work harder, but also know when it's time to part ways. I, I really like that because, you know, with every door that closes, another one opens. That's the way I Definitely. look. Um, you know, and I know a lot of, you know, women in my life that have to deal with these type of situations and being, you know, pressured, you know, and, and, and I hate when it's it's just people in general when you quit something the immediate assumption is that you just gave up is that you're not really yeah. determined you're not really you know yada 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 like no it, it's not always that situation you have to actually understand the reasoning behind why someone chose to do this and why someone chose to do that like i've had situations in my life where i stopped doing something or i stopped going to one school and you know people wanted to say oh you just gave up like you're not really determined. It's like, well, if you walk a mile in my shoes, you may understand mm-hmm. why I made the decision that I made. And that can be said yeah. to everybody. I mean, that's just exactly yeah. that's just people in general that, you know, a lot of the great people that are in the sports reporting, you know, are hosts um, or broadcasters. They didn't all, you know, have a situation where they just said yes to everything and it just got them to where they No, because I've heard a lot of people give me advice saying, oh, make sure you try to, you know, say yes as much as possible. And I'm like, yeah, but that's not always the case. You know, that mm-hmm. sometimes if you just say yes enough, you're not going to get that far. You know, you're just, people yeah. are going to take advantage of you. And, and you have to, you have to keep in your mind always what you really want to try to accomplish and what you want to try to, you know, do and, and what purpose you want to have. And that, if you stick with that and you understand what your personal integrity is and everything, you know, I think that goes a long way in just life mm-hmm. in general, what, you, know, Definitely. you know, no matter who you are, if you stick to what you believe in and you stick in what you want to accomplish, it goes a long way. So I, I really like that. Um, I like the, the tattoo story. It's very cool. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I, really, I, I thought that was very cool. Um, now, Aliyah, before I let you go, as I do with all my guests, because I really enjoy doing this, I'd like to give you the, the floor and the opportunity to kind of promote yourself, uh, promote okay. anything that you have going on. And just where our listeners can go and learn more about you and, you know, you know, listen to things that you, uh, you have to say. Yeah, well, I love Twitter. That's where I do a lot of like interactive stuff. So my Twitter and Instagram, they're Funchel18, which is um, F-U-N-S-C-H-E-L-L-E-18. And I also have a Sports with Aaliyah Facebook and YouTube and um, another Instagram account. And I also do TikTok sometimes, but um, 
but hey, in that, no there is no shame in that. There is no I know, shame in doing TikTok. I, know. I haven't done one yet and I'm not going <laughs> to, um, but you know, there's no shame in it. Yes. So yeah, I, that's where I am. Sports with Aaliyah, A-L-I-Y-A-H. Um, but yeah, go find me and I'm always down um, to give advice or to talk or anything. So that's where you can find me. And I do my talk show on there. So you can, you'll see me promoting my talk show like crazy yeah. anywhere on any platform. So well, yeah. Well, Leah, it, it was, it was such a pleasure to have you on here today. Thank uh, you. I love talking to you. Uh, even though I've only known you for a couple of days or, or talked to you, I, I feel like I've known you for a long time. It was, it was great to, to speak with you. Uh, this was something that this whole topic was very, was very serious to me. And I wanted to talk, to talk about it, not just, you know, just me talking for an hour, but I thought it would be great to have, you know, someone like you who, who knows so much uh, about this situation to come on and, and just, you know, give advice, speak about what's going on, put it in a, in a bigger light. And I appreciate that. And we will definitely have you on again. No question yes. about it. I'd love awesome. to have you on again. And for I'm sure our listeners enjoyed this today. So thank you so much for coming on today. Uh, we really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Of course. And thank you to everyone who listened to this edition of the Mofobo Network podcast. I do not care that this was an hour long. If you cannot stand <laughs> for five minutes, that's your problem, not mine. Uh, if you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you go check it out on Anchor and Spotify. Uh, you can search my name, Neil Villapiano or Mofobo Network, and you will find it. We have a Facebook page, which is called Mofobo Network Presents or just Mofobo Network, and you can stay up to date with new episodes of the podcast. And also the YouTube channel, which this whole interview will be on YouTube on this upcoming Wednesday. So I will do a little bit of editing. It will be up on Wednesday, and you guys can check it out. And uh, definitely, uh, Aaliyah, uh, you can send me your links so I can put them in the uh, description down below so people can find you. Um, so you can check out the YouTube channel, like I said, where we post a weekly video every single Wednesday. Uh, this will be, you know, this interview will be this week's video. Um, and on the Facebook page, you can also stay up to date with the new videos that come out every single Wednesday as well. You can follow me on Twitter at T-H-E-N-V-P-S-H-O-W and on Instagram at N-V-P-Q-B-11. Also, I have, as I mentioned before, I am the host of the Devils State of Mind podcast, which is the New Jersey Devils-based podcast on the Hockey Podcast Network, where we talk about all things Devils, all things hockey. Uh, we post a new episode every single Monday. We just posted one uh, from this past week uh, yesterday, so please go check it out. We're on SoundCloud, Spotify. Uh, we're on iTunes, Google Podcasts. Just search Hockey Podcast Network or Devil State of Mind, and you will find it. We also have a website, devilstateofmind.com, where you can stay up to date just primarily on our episodes. We have a Twitter account at Devil State. We have an Instagram at Devil State of Mind, and we have a Facebook page just like Mofobo to stay up to date with the new episodes. And last, but certainly not least, and again, I know this is like my paragraph and a half outro, but I, you know, everybody, <laughs> everybody seems to love it for whatever reason. Um, go check out my book on Amazon.com, J-E-T-S, Pain, 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 which is about the pain and suffering of being a Jets fan. So if you're a Jets <laughs> fan, a football fan, if you know somebody who's one of those, or if you just if you, if you just want to support me, go check it out on Amazon right now. It's for the price of $19.69. And if you're a Jets fan, you probably know right now why I chose that price. So it's available for hardcover and ebook on Amazon.com right now. So thank you all very much for checking out this edition of the Mofobo Network podcast. And as I always say at the end of every single episode, no matter what's going on in the world, no matter what hardships you might be dealing with, just remember when you wake up in the morning to kick some mofobos. So for Aaliyah, I'm Neil Villapiano. This has been another edition of the Mofobo Network Podcast, and we will see you in the next one. Everyone continue to be safe. If you're going out, just wear a freaking mask. It ain't that hard. Like we, we only have three states right now that are, that are close to you know, containing the virus. We, we need all 50, please. Like let's just try just a little bit to try to make a difference. Thank you to all the essential workers out there, especially in the hospitals working day in and day out to try to help us uh, you know, get past this virus because without your guys' you know, hard work and determination, uh, we wouldn't be as close as we are right now to, uh, to getting to some form of normalcy. So thank you to them. Thank you to everybody who listened today and God bless.